Seven o'clock, oh, seven o'clock on the nose. Good evening, everyone. This is Maggie Miggins. For those of you who don't know me, I am Maggie Miggins and I run uh, the Maggie Miggins Group at Compass Real Estate. I've been selling real estate in uh, this tri-county area for over 25 years. And um, when COVID started, we had we needed a way to reach out to our clients and um, <clears throat> try and connect with them because we couldn't see each other. So thankfully, um, we are all now getting to connect. But one of the things that came out of it was the whole idea of being able to Zoom and being able to bring information to people in this type of platform. And we we still see that it, it's, it has its purpose. And so we're thrilled um, that Andrew K. Becker, as we know him, Andy, um, was good enough to come on our call this evening because, um, you know, I think we're all getting outside. We want our gardens to look beautiful. We want life to be back to normal. And so, um, you know, full disclosure, Andy is our landscaper at our home. Andy, how long have you been taking care of the uh, Megan's estate? Uh, I believe I've been your estate manager now for four or five years. I'm not sure. Time's go by very fast. It does. And I have to say, um, when Andy first came at to our home, there were some beautiful things and, and you're not the guy that's gonna say, hey, let's rip this all out and start all over. There are some things that you would keep. And then there were other things that you um, said, you know what, this needs to go. Mm -hmm. but why don't we replace it with this? So I, what I'd love to be able to talk about is um, the process. How do, you, how do you start when you come to someone's home and, um, and decide how to how to start the process for them, or even if they're doing it, you know, they're do-it-yourselfers, different things that they should be looking for um, when they are um, getting re getting ready to redo their gardens and their landscaping. So talk mm -hmm. a little bit about um, how do you make your decisions for well, especially in this area. So similar um, case in point when I came to your house and we we discussed what you your existing landscape had. And I thought that you had what I called some, some good bones and some things that were a little tired that needed to go, which mm -hmm. gave us opportunity to put in some new things uh, to create a nicer flowing balanced landscape. Um, and I see really what, um, what the client really needs. Do they need to um, do a landscape renovation? Do they need to do a total redo? Do they just need a really good pruning feeding, mulching, and add a few things. So, so each house is a little bit different and I try to feel the people out and really it's their home. So I like to hear what, what's important to them and um, what they're looking for in me. Um, and you know, if they can give me some input on what they're looking for, that helps me um, to create my plan and my, my vision and my ideas. Awesome, awesome. So, um, you know, the one thing I want to say sometimes when we're helping people or coaching people or teaching people. Um, I always forget, and I don't know why I do this, but is there an easier way to remember the difference between say an annual and a perennial? How do we know which one is which? Um, you're, you're really going to need to learn the difference between annuals and perennials. I'm okay. not a big annual person so much in the garden. I like to use annuals and tropicals and different plants like that in my container plantings, urns by people's pool, um, th planters by the front door, maybe the back gate going into the property. Um, so annuals really give you that overwhelming summer color while perennials are more seasonal and they the, the perennials bloom at different times throughout the year. Um, and I really try to use more perennials in the garden and less annuals in the garden. So I like I like things to come back and be happy and visit us again. Amen. So annuals, so we all know, annuals, a typical annual would be an impatient, a begonia, a carnation, um, uh, geraniums. Um, a vin vinca flower, p petunia, some salvias, uh, marigolds is a big one, um, sun patients, New Guinean patients. Those are more along the annual line of flowers. Okay, so they don't come back. They're pretty, they're colorful, but they won't come back. So we'll, 
We're doing some slides, which of course we're going to bring up now, right? Sure. So start. Um, everybody, we're going to share our screen with everyone, and you can see um, Andy and I will be to the right. And here we go. Landscaping like a pro with Andrew K. Becker. Thank you, Andy. Um, so we talked about you. So when you're analyzing space for people or when people are analyzing their own space, what is it that they're supposed to be looking for? Um, when you analyze your space, um, you really want to see um, what kind of exposure to the sun you have. Do you have sun? Do you have shade? Do you have a dry or a wet area? Okay. Um, you definitely want to consider in short hills what your deer population is. Um, do you have commuting deers that just cut through the property? Or do you have residential deer that live there? That can change the perspective of how severely damaged some of their eating will be on some of your plantings. Um, and you look at the space and you decide, you know, how am I going to get color throughout the season? Maybe create an evergreen screen for privacy. Um, similar to some of the areas where, for instance, we did on the side of your house where we, we were looking at the space and I said, can't really landscape here. You have a drainage issue. We use the riverbed stone to create a beautiful pathway to the backyard, but in the top where we had light and we had some um, raised beds with the boulders, we did our plantings that you enjoy out your kitchen window. So you just have to evaluate space and try to see what makes the most sense. So um, sun versus shade. Let me go back in because I do want to talk about that sun versus shade. We just were looking at shady, a shady piece and a a sunny piece, uh, two different landscapes of people. Um, the one, can we go back one a second? And by the way, we will answer any question you have. Shady Yard, it seems like there's an awful lot of green on the left of that one side. And then on the right, am I looking at uh, azaleas and maybe some? Um, you're, you're looking at some uh, uh, red and pink astilbes. You're looking at some. Um, beautiful Tardiva hydrangea on the right side. Um, and you have some hydrangeas on the left, some arborvitae. Um, so really well put together with color and probably in an, in an enclosed backyard that the deer cannot get to because some of that stuff would be very appetizing to them. For the deer. And then on the right, um, on the right you have, they just look to be blooming, some allium, which... I've yes. seen more and more of these allium. That's that long flower with the purple in it. One of mm -hmm. them went white to the right. The allium is good in the sunny yard, right? That's where they really pop up the most. That's correct. So they'll, they'll take some, they will take some part shade. I mean, they're really wonderful from about right about now, from about May 10th to about J June 10th. They're good for about a month. And, uh, they come in many different colors. There's some blues, there's some purples. Um, I've seen some wonderful whites. Um, they make a nice impact in the garden. They make a nice impact in the garden. Would you go to mm -hmm. the they're, they're very tall, so they can rise above your under plantings, which can also be perennials, but they make a real statement. Right, okay, got it. Now, um, we did have a question that was in there about families of deer, and so, when we're talking about sun versus shade or deer or no deer, talk to me about Andy a little bit about the deer. And we know they wreak havoc on our gardens. I was just at someone's right. house yesterday, they ate half her coleus and she was going back to buy more coleus. I didn't know deer even liked coleus, um, but there are certain plants that deer don't like that we should be putting in our gardens. Correct. So. Like the deer, the deer really is like a, uh, a case study for me. Um, you, you have, if you have residential deer on your property and you use deer resistant things, where we had a very severe snowstorm this winter where you get two and three feet, if that sticks around for three, six weeks, all, all bets are off. I mean, if they're hungry, they're going to eat. And different herds of deer have different appetites. And deer are creatures of habit. They travel the same paths pretty regularly. Um, if you have commuting deer, which just kind of cut through the property, they might bite and walk a little bit. Um, and, and you can get away with some things that 
aren't completely deer resistant that you can plant. Uh, but you do have to take into consideration what your uh, occupancy of deer is. So if you were to name like three deer resistant plants, what sure. would, or shrubs or what would they usually don't bother with? What would let's, let's, try, let's do a tree, let's do some shrubs and let's do some perennials. And we can even do some annuals. How does that sound? Okay, that's good. So if we were gonna start with trees, um, they're, they're not gonna bother a Norway spruce. Uh, they're not gonna bother a Canadian hemlock. Um, it, they're not going to bother um, boxwoods, is very deer resistant. Um, there's a, a really nice plant called a cephalotaxis, which is kind of, it's, its name is a hedgehog. And that's kind of replacing the old English hue, which were the hedges all around Short Hills, which we can't plant anymore. And when you have something like an English hue or a Manhattan euonymus or, or a perennial hosta, that and roses, hybrid, hybrid tea roses especially, that actually brings the deer in. It's like a, uh, a feast for them. So if you can try to eliminate those things, you're better off. Um, things like leather leaf, leather leaf viburnum is a great shrub that they don't bother with. Um, the dutzia that I really like, the nico dutzia and the, pe the, the peach blossom dutzia okay. are wonderful. And in terms of perennials, um, there's great deer resistant perennials, things like hellebore, um, things like pulmonaria. Um, ferns are fantastic, especially in a shady area, the deer will not bother them. So there are, you just have to be very aware of what you're planting and the grasses work very well. You would think the grasses, the deer would eat the grasses because you see them grazing on the lawn, but the Hakana Chloe grass, um, Carex grasses, Carl Foster grasses, um, switch grasses, these big annual grasses, um, terrific. And even the reblooming lilac that you see on the screen is a fantastic reblooming lilac that the deer don't eat. And it's fragrant and it makes such a color impact. It's really wonderful. I have a question. The boxwoods, you talk about boxwoods and we see boxwoods all over the, you know, these towns that we, that yeah. we service. Talk to me about, there was a blight on the boxwood. So what happened with the blight? Is there still a blight? Are we buying boxwoods anymore? What's going on with the boxwoods? Fantastic question. So yes, the boxwood is the most deer resistant plant there is. Um, they have not, I've never seen any damage to a boxwood. Um, you have to spray them for something called leaf miner which is a larvae that grows on the back of the leaf that can over time destroy the boxwoods. But yes, there was something called boxwood blight. Um, it reared its ugly head about three years ago. Um, when it's about 85 and humid, um, it, it can um, arrive. There are people like Save a Tree, um, Bartlett Tree Service. They have applications to control the blight. Overhead watering where it's humid and you're constantly having your spray heads soak the boxwood makes it very susceptible to boxwood blight. We haven't seen much of it around. Oh, Andy, you muted, hold on. You muted yourself somehow. Can you help? He's muted somehow. Put your glasses on. <laughs> uh, hold on, he's coming back. I will tell you those green giant arborvitaes that you see on the left, is something that Andy had planted uh, at our house, and it is a nice. Very, I'm back. Very, I'm back. Very, Andy, <laughs> put your hands in your lap. <laughs> Don't touch my tech, my, my tech support came in. No problem. So yeah, um, the boxwood blight um, may be back. Um, what we're doing um, as a commercial contractor when we prune, we disinfect with a product we all know called Lysol and you disinfect your pruning shears, your loppers, your hand pruners with Lysol in between properties. So if you're exposed to it, you've stopped it at that source. Um, but I, I haven't seen much of it around in two years and hopefully it won't come back. I was just telling them about the green giant arborvitaes. You love those because sometimes don't arborvitaes have a tendency like with too much snow and everything, they bend over or they, they get too... too um, um, yeah, the old, the old, we didn't have access to these green giants until about 
10 or 15 years ago. So yeah. we use things called emerald green arborvitae, nigra arborvitae, and pyramidalis. Um, and they're all very susceptible to deer problems. And yes, they have a lot of problems in severe weather. While the green giant has that wonderful leader that grows, sure. I like it so much because it keeps its skirt all the way to the ground. And it makes for a great property delineator. It works very well with that for screening. You also talked about some grasses. And I want to see if I can, there, the carrots yeah. evergold, which I've seen before. Now, talk to me about grasses. Is, if somebody has some grasses on their lawns or in their gardens, can they split them if they're getting too big? Can they take them and then transplant some the same way you could do with maybe a hospice as well, when it starts to get sure. to be too much. We, we divide grasses, just like we divide hostas, iris, different perennials. Um, the best time is early spring when they're, they're just coming out of the ground. Okay. You can divide a big hosta and make it into four and repurpose them throughout your garden. And okay. yes, you can do that with um, the all gold Hackana Chloe grass, the Carrick's grass. But the big grasses, like the um, zebra grass yes. and the very large grasses like you have in your backyard, mm -hmm. um, as we split a few uh, two weeks ago, very easy to divide and just feed them with a mycorrhizal healthy start fertilizer, which helps establish roots, has some moisture gels in it to retain moisture. And it's a root building fertilizer and it's fantastic. Yeah. Very easy to move. I do want to show, um, this was that Dutia you talked about. This is a newer one, the cherry blossom one. Cherry blossom. And then this is the one, um, this is the one that happened to be in my garden. And yes. there's three of them. And it's the prettiest looking white, tiny little petite flower. They're blooming mm -hmm. now. So it gives, it gives a little bit of color. It seems like for my garden, I think it's important for people to know that in terms of the gardens, you almost want to have a little bit of color throughout the season. I think so many people want color throughout the season. So whether it's the weeping cherry that blooms first, that goes to the viburnum, and then that comes to here, and then that gives it time for the, the roses and all these other flowers to come up. This yes. one will last how long, Miss Ditsy? This is a beautiful flower. Oh, that, 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 that hangs in there for four, four or five weeks. And, and like you said, it, it lasts a while, which lets our other things like the hydrangeas, the roses, and the different things start to procure themselves to, to come to flowering. Yes. Peonies. Let's talk about peonies a second, which is one love of them. Favorite. I love a peony. I love them. Uh, are those, can you divide a peony or no? Y you can. Y yes, when they get very large and established, you, you can divide them, but you need to really do that in March. In March. Um, because once they start to come up, you, you really have a hard time dividing with your spade. So you want to do it definitely in early March. Um, okay. As soon as they start to show, you want to divide them early. Divide and them. you want to also with the peony, which is very important, is when you divide them and you know where they are and you start to see them coming up, you really want to get your hoop cages with, uh, onto your peony so that the peony grows through the cage, it comes up, it buds, um, and then when it flowers, they're so heavy, they don't fall over because the cage is holding them up. Cage. And that's the, really the best way you can to have your peony garden. Okay. I, I, I think they're just some of my favorites. Um, I just want to say, those were some of the other grasses that you talked about, uh, the mm -hmm. Japanese forest grass. I'm going to move you. These and are there's the something there's that we're a, seeing all over town. And those are these, the allium, mm -hmm. is it the gold that's buried in the fall? The allium would go in, uh, preferably sometime after Halloween, end of October, okay. um, when it starts to chill off. Um, and you would plant them. Um, the old trick was using bone meal when you did daffodil bulbs. We can't really do tulip bulbs here because the deer will mow them down, but the daffodils are deer resistant. Okay. Um, and when I, when I do a large job in the fall, I love to buy a bag of 150 daffodils on the house and put them in as a great spring surprise when everything comes up. It's a nice gesture to give to your clients some daffodil bulbs that will last forever. And you plant them with the plant saver product. You do. Somebody, we had two questions, believe it or not. One of which, where did we go? 
One person asked, I have been visited by deer multiple times this spring. They're eating my ranunculus that I have in my planters. What do Ren I do? Ranunculus, yes. Ranunculus. What do we one do? Of my, one of my favorite flowers, and you will only see that flower in late March, the first week of April. Wonderful for container planting. But yes, same as the spring pansies, same as the bachelor buttons, same as ran ranunculus, the deer will go after that aggressively. So you have to spray with a good um, repelzol, which is a nice um, granular or deer scram, or you can get some regular deer off and just spray it. And you should really do that every 10 days. It's, it's when you skip for a few days, you think you're gonna to get to it and you don't, that's when the deer come and they get you. So it's deer off or reposal? Repels all. And one of, my, one of my favorites is called deer scram. It's, it's, a, it's a granular product. It comes with a little scooper. You just scoop into it, spritz it onto the, your, your plants. And what that is, is it's a deer repellent that is, is nasal. So when they go to eat it, some of the granular goes into their nasal passage and it really bothers them. And they know to stay away from your plantings then. That's okay. And are peonies deer resistant? Yes. They are. They and there is a hybrid peony, which is very popular now coming in unbelievable colors, yellow, peach, beautiful big reds. Uh, there is some hybrid peonies that are out instead of in, um, in comparison to our old traditional peonies. And oh. you can find them at the farm at Green Village and they're absolutely beautiful. Um, somebody asked, can the deer repellent granules that you talked about fall on the plant itself or will that hurt the plants? It does not hurt the plant. It's organic, it's not toxic. It doesn't hurt the deer. Okay. Um, for, the, for the deer huggers, it doesn't hurt the deer. And um, it works great. And it, and it actually, as it breaks down, it becomes a fertilizer into the soil. So it, it's kind of doing two things at once and it works really great. Leslie, can you get yeah. this to move for me, baby? Because I want to show them, um, I want to show some work that, um, what is this? I want to move the, uh, I want to go backwards to make sure I covered everything. It's not moving. Oh. Okay. Keep going. Then stop for a second. Andy, I want to talk about um, mm -hmm. you, you have this house here that holds these mamba jamba hostas and this riverbed, the river rocks. So yeah. take take us through this a little bit why somebody would want to use river rocks and what's the point of having river rocks. And sure. um, I mean, it looks lovely. There's that nice arbor that goes down to the this nice big piece of the slate and into, yeah. talk about so, this. So I, I think, you know, almost every property has one area of, hey, that's a tough spot. You know, you can't get the grass to grow. You have a drainage issue there. Um, you need to make it functional. You know, I'm a big believer and if you keep trying to reseed a certain area of the lawn and it doesn't work, well, eliminate the lawn and, and landscape it and plant it and make it nice instead of trying to get the grass to grow year after year. Um, something like the picture on the left, um, on a downward grade, you know you have a lot, a lot of water running there. You know you're not going to get mulch to stay there. You're not going to get grass to grow there. It's just nice to nice and clean. You put a you dig it out. You put a landscape fabric down. It keeps the weeds out perfectly. It's a one time fix. You set those stones. You put the riverbed stone in there, and it's done. One and done. And you know that it's going to last. It's not going to wash away. And it really serves the purpose of finishing off that air, hard hard to landscape area. And, and you can see along the fence. Um, we were able to put some, some daisies, um, some different plants, some daisies, some, uh, can't, quite, can't, can't quite remember what some of those were. I can't quite see it. Probably some lamb's ears, stackies, uh, some different things there. Give you great color. You have a little mulch bed out the kitchen window. You have something to look at. And then on the right, where we had the boulder wall, 
We put some nice um, elephant ear hosta because the deer don't get in there. We have some nice color with the um, double file viburnum. And another great deer resistant plant, uh, viburnum, is called the summer snowflake, which is right above the wall right there with those white flowers. And I intersperse some butterfly bush, which attracts butterflies and gives wonderful midsummer color um, that can get up to five and six feet tall. And every spring you cut the butterfly bush down to, to 12 inches and you'll get five feet of growth in one year and you'll get great flowers from that. I, I do have a question for you about the butterfly bush and they do it. Sure. Sure. Um, is that a native plant? Um, I don't know if that's native or not, to be perfectly honest. I'm not exactly sure. Um, I don't think it is. There are several different butterfly bushes. Um, there's some dwarf ones. Little Pugster is a cute little one. Um, they come in a variety of colors. You can find them anywhere from yellow to white to pink and purple and some reds. Uh, and there's about four different or five different varieties we use around here, but all very deer resistant and very hardy, but you just don't cut them in the fall. It's definitely a spring cutback. Same with the annual grasses. You never really cut the grasses too low in the fall. If you wanna cut them in half to, so they look a little cleaner, that's all right. But you, you really cut them back in March when you do your spring tune-up or your spring cleanup um, you to your property. Do you mean perennial grasses, not annual grasses, right? Perennials, because those- uh, I mean, well, perennial and annual grasses are pretty much the same. Are we they? call those grasses annual grasses because they come back. They say it's, you know, it's not like an annual flower. We call them annual grasses, okay. but they come back every year. Andy, some of the products, somebody had a question for you. Some of these products we talked about, deer scram, deer off, proposal, hazel, do they hurt dogs? Can they hurt dogs? Do the dogs have, do we have to be careful with our pets? Or no. Dogs? No, this is not like it's a serious chemical or anything. Really what it is, is they take things like, um, ready for this? Pepper, hard boiled eggs, they grind them up. It's all organic. Uh, cayenne pepper, different, different things like that. So they try to keep it as animal friendly and people friendly as possible um, with no chemicals. It's all organic. Is there a weed killer that you can recommend that would work that's not toxic? for dogs or kids? Like people want a green lawn, but they don't want to necessarily use, you know, like Roundup or any of that kind of stuff, which is so bad. Okay. So this is, this is, this is interesting. So if you really want to do the lawn properly, I recommend my guy, Paul Mackinson, Mackinson Turf Management, who we use at your house. If you want a weed free, perfect lawn, that's the way you have to go. If you, if, if you're, against the chemicals. And I'm a chemical free guy. I don't do any chemical applicating. I just chose not to do that many years ago. Um, you, there are people you can Google online to find chemical, chemical free organic lawn. Um, it will not give you the results. It will not give you the green. It will not give you the weed control, but it's really getting better every year as the chemical um, lawn applications are under a little bit more pressure to get a little bit more organic and they're getting better every year. So if you Google it and you look for a local applicator that's organic, um, those people are out there. When it comes to lawn, one thing I would say, um, if you have children, if you're working in the garden, if you have someone like myself maintaining your property, I think it's very important to do a one year um, tick control application on the lawn. That does have some chemicals in it that will take care of some of your pesticide issues, chinch bug, um, grubs, ticks. Um, that is something I think with the Lyme disease and, and people playing um, which come along with the deer that I think it's, I just think it's important to do. I try to, I try to recommend that to people. I think it's just better for the family environment to be protected from the deer tick. Well, Lyme disease is a terrible, terrible, oh, terrible thing. thing. I terrible want thing. to, I don't know why these won't move it. Let's see. I do want, um, I want to go to Susan's 
piece, the difference with, um, we can go back one second. I want to show, so Andy, we have a before and after of a project that you did do. Yeah. Um, one of the women that worked with us um, recently bought a condo. So she wanted to yeah. brighten it up and make it hers. So even though it is a condo, she got to, to make some changes. So originally, this is what the outside of the condo looked like. It was, we see some river rock, we see some something in the right-hand side. I don't know what that is on the picture on the left, this piece here, this is some kind of a boxwood overgrown maybe? I don't know, what is that? Um, I believe that was a type of boxwood. I'm sorry, that was euonymus. That was, um, that was a yellow variegated euonymus. Okay. And, and you have a, you have a um, one shrub in the back right corner. Here. Uh, yeah, you have a red bud tree here, which was actually came into color really nice after I left, which was actually looking nice. So you uh, left that tree. I left the tree. I did. Okay, so it, let's see what let's see what miracles you work. This looks pretty pretty bad. I I'm not impressed with the way that looks. <laughs> but but wait, there's more. Ta da! Ta so we did that. Wow. So you yeah. left. You left some rocks, but you put bigger rocks. The other ones were tinier rocks, river rocks. Yeah, I, I, put, I put some pretty rocks in. Pretty I, rocks. Put a, I put a nice American boxwood to screen the gas meter on the house a little bit. That's That'll it. grow in nice. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is had, I put some hostas in the back. Um, yeah. you, can, you can see the red bud came out with the color. Very pretty. That looks I, I put some, some hookara. She had some iris here. She had some nice astilbe coming up. Um, I put in pulmonaria, brunera. This is a nice plant on the corner. I really like the yellow. It's called creeping it's jenny. Creeping, that'll jenny. Come, creeping jenny, that'll come back. So um, I put some all gold, all gold hack in a Chloe grass. And uh, it's probably grown out quite a bit since I did this maybe about five weeks ago. So these are the grasses and you put, it looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like about a dozen of those grasses. In the back, the yellows are called hookara, uh -huh. which will give her a, a tall spiky flower, the orange ones and the yellow ones. Okay. And the things out on the point is creeping Jenny. So what I did was, if you look at the photo on the left, the Here. lawnmower, the lawnmower was coming all the way in. It was, it, it didn't make sense. So I just enlarged the garden and made it more uh, more pedestrian friendly as an entrance way. And as that grows in and you, you know, over time, add a, a couple little things in here and there, a perennial garden like that's always a little bit of a work in progress. Um, it's going to grow in real nice. And uh, now the lawnmower doesn't have to come up and almost to the front door. And now yeah. you have a garden. Right. It's, and it's lovely. I think you did a great job on that. Yeah. I want to talk about, because I can see it in there, um, mulch. I'm going to skip around to, uh, on everybody. So mulch. Mulch. Well, mulch. I want to talk about, so, where is it? We have it. Huh? So if, if you can go back to the oh, picture sure. along the roadside there. Sure. Uh, I just want to show people some stuff. Sure. There. That's, yeah. Here. That looks like it's been freshly mulched. So what I did there was we had a bunch of huge overgrown hollies and interesting things way out on the road. And the vision for the homeowner coming in and out of the driveway was terrible. Um, she literally had to drive her car three feet, four feet out in the road before she could really see what was going on. So we took some big hollies out and a bunch of overgrown stuff. We kept the things in the back, which are some big Carlisi viburnums and That's some things. Yeah. And I put in the green giant arborvitae there, and I put in deer resistant osmanthus, which are um, the three tall hollies and the variegated one right there. Those are all the same family osmanthus. Yeah. They're salt tolerant, they're very tough, they're deer resistant. And what the mulch I used there was um, hemlock mulch. Right. It's a, it's a natural weed suppressant. It, um, doesn't have any dye on it. It's, it goes down, it lasts. When There's a lot to know about mulch. I mean, when you use the recycled mulch that you, 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 know, you know your neighbor did the mulching over the weekend because you can smell it in your kitchen. 
Mo most likely that's a recycled product. And with that comes a lot of different things, mold, mildew, weeds, uh, possible garbage, construction stuff. You, you don't really know what you're putting back in the garden. So here, here's a little example. Landscapers do a big pruning job. They pull a lot of weeds, poison ivy, sumac, ragweed, God forbid, thistleweed, all the no-nos that you don't want. They put it in a pile, they wet it down, it rots, they grind it. They sell it to you as mulch and you're putting all that stuff right back in your garden. And, and after using that and realizing what's going on when clients would say to me, I have all these weeds I never had before. And I'd say to myself, where are these weeds coming from? Well, after I did my doctorate of education in mulch, I realized that you can't, you can't use the recycled material. You have to use a 100% hemlock mulch. And after I used this mulch um, at a property for two and three and four years consistently, my weeding is reduced 85 to 90 percent. And I don't do any chemicals in the beds. No pre, like a pre, a pre-emergent. I don't do that. Um, and, and it works really, really well. And this mulch lasts. Mulch is an every year thing but the hemlock mulch really lasts. And so does cedar mulch. That's a good mulch to use too. I um, you. you said something important. Yes. You put these three plants in because they're hardy and they're salt resistant. So that's got to do with the snow when the plows are coming through and they've got salt underneath. Correct. And boom, going up onto your property in here. So, so you have to make sure the, the, the plants closer to the road are not only deer resistant, but salt resistant. Hardy is the word used. Very hard. Hardy. Hard, hardy is the word, but they're they're tough. They're 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 a very hardy plant, um, and and they probably would tolerate a little bit of salt more than a lot of the fragile things that you would put along that you wouldn't want to put along a road. So you you have to just think your way through and says what's going to be tough, what's going to handle the winter, and and you know when people do these jobs, you have to think how things are going to grow in three, five, and ten years. So you can see I, I space things out properly I'm off the road. I don't want to recreate the same condition that the homeowner had with the vision. So now she's got great vision coming out of there and uh, the space really filled in beautiful. It looks lovely. That looks really nice. Um, we talked about your, your favorite flowers, some of them columbine, hellebore, white hellebore. Now yeah. the hellebore hang, they almost hang upside down, don't they? They almost hang upside down. Hellebore, hellebore is a really cool plant. It, it, it's part shade to shade. It flowers predominantly in, in, it's the first thing to flower in your garden in March, end of March. Uh, and you, you just clip off some of the old leaves from last year and the hellebores come back. They're deer resistant. And after they're done flowering, they make a beautiful plant in, in, the, in the garden for the whole season. Really, really a nice plant. Just green, just like mostly all green. Then once the flowers are finished, they're they're all green, and 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 you can get these with beautiful pink flowers, red. The whites are very pretty. Um, right now, the green giants, the hellebores is a perennial. Green giants obviously is a tree. The boxwoods, um, the Carlisi viburnum, which you really like. Those are all the those are all the rave right now. That's what everybody wants to plant. So th that, those are what's very popular right now. Um, we talked about those. We talked about my Nico. Yeah. Um, we talked about, talk uh, about this house. Mm -hmm. um, we have a springtime picture. So sure. there's color in there, but those are perennials that are lining the wall. I mean, those are all round boxwoods, right? Very round boxwoods. And behind them is, this is a- um, A rhododendron. A rhodi, which are blooming now. And yeah, then the, just these are annuals, right? Are these some kind of a those? Those are actually spring pan spring pansies. I see. I, I took that picture about a month ago. Okay. Um, those boxwoods are all transplants from the backyard to where we put in a uh, fish pond. I'm a. I really like to repurpose plants. If I can reuse things in the landscape, I do it. And it just so happened that what was up front there needed to be changed. So I brought those boxwoods from the back and put them in the front. I have a common brick paver sidewalk I put in with large river rocks to edge the beds, which is a nice look. 
So yeah. the garden up the, the garden on, on the closest side of the, by the lawn, that, that's a seasonal garden. So that will be done four to five times a year, spring pansies. It will be an annual garden in about 10 days from now. All that will come out and on both sides will be annuals. Um, in late September, it will all come out and it will be 20 to 30 mums of different sizes and cabbages. And then that's it there. The, oh, there that's there I am. Yeah. <laughs> and then she likes the pansies. So when I do the mums, the annuals come out. I put some some um, cabbages and kale in there. Sure. And uh, she, the winter pansies, we call them. And then in the spring, if you can believe the picture before, half the pansies in that garden were planted in November. And I just and they, they all come back. I hit them with the deer scram that we talked about every week when I service her property, her beautiful lawn. And, uh, in, and then in the winter, when we do our Christmas decorating, um, we do big, a big wreath above the, the two windows on the left. We do garland and lights around the door. And I do beautiful uh, lights on her railings. And I do cabbages up and down all the gardens. Really beautiful. That looks lovely, Andy. Um, Thank you. We talked about mulch and the yeah. So these are so I have to tell you I probably shouldn't say this but I will tell you my least favorite color mulch is this orange one. I'm like, what is that? Is that like has does it have dye in it? Yeah. So so the orange mulch that you see. So you you can buy orange mulch that's dyed. You can buy black dye mulch, which is that stuff most likely. And in front of that is brown dye. I'm not a big I don't like them because what are they dying? Are they dying construction debris? Are they dying? Um, old pallets is a big thing they do because people don't want to reuse pallets. So they crush them, which is just regular wood and they color that. And if you look at this mulch in a year after it, when it goes down, I have to admit the color is vibrant and all that. The black dye mulch is a big South Jersey thing. And I've just had a discussion with a man that wanted to consider using it. And I went through my whole mulch agenda and he, and he agreed hundred percent that that is not what he wanted to use. Um, it doesn't look natural to me. The hemlock mulch looks natural to me. The um, hammer mill mulch is the other mulch that I use, which is like a bark mulch. That's a very nice mulch too. You just have to make sure that the hammer mill mulch you're getting is not recycled mulch, which would be called Sometimes they call it hardwood, but it's really recycled mulch. So if you can get straight hammer mill at Fusco Brothers in, on River Road, fantastic mulch. I love it. I use it often. If you want to get the hemlock mulch, you can get the hemlock mulch that I like at the Millstone Lawn and Garden down on Valley Street. Right, before, right in between the north and south course of the Maplewood Country Club. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic product. Oh, okay, that's good to know because some, I mean, sometimes we see and we think it's so much easier to just go buy bags of it and stuff. And you're like, that's where you're going to get the different color and you don't know the, what's in the quality of it necessarily. Um, Something like these this. Other companies, and, they'll bring and it. Also, yeah. ordering, ordering how much mulch a homeowner could guesstimate, you know, every so often in the New York Times, you see a woman asking her husband in a cartoon, Honey, I think you bought too much mulch and the mulch pile is bigger than the house. Yeah, yeah. So you have to kind of gauge on how much mulch you need and they sell it by the cubic yard. So don't think you need 10 cubic yards if you have a little tiny house in the Glenwood section. You probably need two or three or four. Okay. So how just many, try to, how try many to did gauge you need that. For me? How many did you need for my house? Because you just did ours. Um, uh, a six or seven. I have my notes in the other room. Six or seven for your house. It's the big hill garden and everything in the back that eats up a lot of a lot of mulch. Yep. Got it. Let's just see. Lawn. We talked a bit. So this is yep. grub damage. Tell us what a grub does. Um, a grub is a worm, and a grub eats the roots of the lawn. So a good way to know if you have a grub infestation is when you come out in the morning and you see sections of your lawn turned over 
all turned over. What that is, is raccoons and skunks digging for the worms. They're high protein and they eat them. But that's an indication that you have grubs. If you don't have um, animals like that around your property, you can walk up to the lawn and you literally can pick pieces of lawn up and there's no roots holding the lawn to the soil. Um, the product they use is GrubX. Um, and I would defer to my uh, excellent lawn applicator, uh, Mackinson Turf Management. Um, he, he'd be happy to come by on my recommendation or referral um, to give any, anyone listening a free consultation on what's going on with, with their lawn, um, what services he can provide. He does do some organic. If you want to cut it down a little bit on the chemicals, he, he's open to that. Um, but he's the best analyst when it comes to the lawns. And the lawn is a work in progress too. It needs aeration. It needs um, crabgrass control. Um, it probably needs, like we did at your house, Maggie, we did the big front lawn redo last year. It turned out fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, soil and seeding and a little, a little aeration and seeding every year, every other year to keep that lawn looking full and nice is, is, is important. Green, like that's a bad lawn. But that's a nice lawn. Look at that pretty lawn. You that's a nice lawn. Diagonal. Yep, yep. That, that is a lawn I do. And that is the result of my um, spring cleaning, taking care of the property, thatching the lawn, power raking the lawn and cleaning it in the spring, and working uh, cohesively with Mackinson Turf Management to get you that lawn. I mean, that is a really green, lush, weed-free, healthy lawn. Yeah, it looks lovely. Let me just see. That's a happy <coughs> client. That's a happy client. <laughs> that, that, that is a man, that, uh, when I saw how happy he was when I landscaped his house, that really made me feel good. And yes, that's a, an Andrew Becker happy customer. That's a happy face. He is a very happy man. Um, I think so. He should be. <laughs> Where to find supplies? Yes. Orange Garden Center in Orange. The farms at Green Village in Chatham. They have some of the prettiest flowers out and, and unusual. Um, that was where I found my, we don't have a picture of it. And I'll take a picture when it comes up in the fall. You know, my favorite, the anemones. It's the prettiest. Fall little, anemone. Oh, it's so, a pretty little white with a little orange face. It's so terrific. I love those. Mm -hmm. Let me I, just say a little, little something. Orange Garden Center is down on Alden Street. In Orange, if you stay, take Scotland Road all the way down over Route 280 uh, and just keep going over Park Avenue, he's down on the right. You want to talk to Artie, tell him I sent you. you, you would, it, is a, um, it is a garden paradise in a place where you might not expect it. Um, he has the best plants in the area. Um, the farm at Green Village, you can talk to Brian or David, or if you're talking flowers, go see my friend Maria. If you're doing your containers, you're doing your gardens, you're doing vegetables, the best people up there with the best quality, high-end retail, out the door, things you need. And if you wanna to go to a nice place, Williams Nursery, right over um, in Westfield, when you go over Route 22 and around, right before you go around the bend to get on Broad Street, they're right on the left, you, you couldn't meet a nicer group of people. Um, you can get all your container plantings there, shrubs, um, great annuals and perennials, and their fall mums and cabbages are fantastic. So just a little information on those three places. Now, if somebody wanted to contact you, Andy Becker, they would just yeah. hear your phone. That's your, is that your house phone? 376-5186? That, that's the office phone. Mm -hmm. And that would be the best way to reach me. Right. And if you leave a message, I'm happy to call back. It does take me a couple of days on that number. Um, I'm not, I don't give the cell phone out to everyone because it's just a little overwhelming. But if you'd like to call me and leave me a message, I'm sure within a few days, I'll get right back to you. Absolutely. And ladies and gentlemen, so you know, um, Andy has been doing our lawn for about five years. We're absolutely thrilled with him. Um, for those of you who don't know Andy, Andy grew up in town in Milburn, uh, Milburn slash Red Hills. Um, his mother's the former mayor, Elaine Becker, fabulous mayor back in the day. Um, so Andy's familiar with uh, the soil around here, regardless if it's Maplewood or South Orange or Milburn, Red Hills or Summit or Chatham, it's pretty similar. 
um, but he's a local guy all his life. So um, he does, his information is phenomenal. And if you do have questions, give him a shout out. He, he'd be more than happy to answer them. I will go to, um, see, we have a couple more questions for you. Sure. Um, a farmer told me that deer don't like the smell of mint and planting mint keeps them away. Um, and so they've had, a, they've had success with deer out, which smells like mint on um, pansies and tulips. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Francis. Yeah, they put mint, they put mint in all those products. Yeah. Okay, so and and, like an, old, an old secret, you know, before all these fancy deer scrams and repels all and deer off and deer stopper was Irish spring in a half pound uh, potato salad container next to your favorite plants, let the water in there and then drip some of the soap on it. And, and believe it or not, I know people that swore by that. Irish spring, mint. I, yeah, I think there is something true about the mint. There's mint, there's mint by that garden with the pansies. Uh, yeah. There's a high, high deer population there. Uh, I'm pretty religious about the deer scram, but if I happen to forget it, I have to say they, they don't really hit that too often. And there's a lot of mint right up against the house. A, um, four by eight foot patch of mint in a window well, which the client loves. I think it's a mint julep thing. I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't want to give her. I don't want to give her secrets away. <laughs> don't give her secrets away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Andy, this has been so wonderful. Um, you. uh, you've done a fabulous job for everybody that's on the call. Um, any last pearly words of wisdom that you want to leave with us? Is there, uh, Somebody's thinking about doing their gardens. They can also wait maybe in the fall, uh, in the late summer, sometimes you'll find things on sale as well, right? I mean, I'm always one for value. You'll find some, you won't get everything in the pick, but sometimes the uh, the different um, nurseries will put things on sale at the end of the season. Is that correct as well? There's there's some uh, something to be said about that. I've done some late season December jobs and they just want to get rid of stuff and they'll make a bargain with you, yeah. Some of the stuff might be a little picked through, but there's been some real treasures I found at the end of the season too. Um, you know, I would just say this, um, when it comes to your landscape right now, yes. and with everything going on in the real estate world, um, curb appeal and keeping your house looking good yes. and spending the little extra money gives you value and gives you, um, you know, gives you value and lets people know that you're taking care of your property. And I always say this, if it looks nice on the outside, people say it must be wonderful on the inside. Well, the same works in the reverse fashion. If you don't keep up with it and you don't make it pop a little bit, they might not be as fast to want to come in and look through your house when it's time to move on to the next chapter. So I think keeping the house looking nice from the curb and from outside not only makes people enjoy it but it makes the homeowner enjoy it while they're there too i think that's very important i agree and we know being in real estate you only get one chance to make a first good impression and when somebody does drive up um to a house and they see things are overgrown their grass isn't cut things mm -hmm. are um just overgrown it just it doesn't bode well i guess is what i think they do think oh my God, if this isn't taken care of on the outside what is lacking on the inside even things that I can't see behind walls, what could possibly mm -hmm. be going on there? So I do, I do think that's really important. Ladies, so if anyone, if anyone sees me on the street on Chatham Road or they're walking their dog and they see me out working, please stop and say hello. Um, if there's anything I can ever help with, please let me know. And uh, I hope to see everyone soon. Thanks for tonight. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I hope everyone got some uh, beneficial ideas and thoughts out of this. So thank you so much. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Andy. Andrew K. Becker. I think you did a fabulous job. And I, and I love everyone at your group. And uh, thank you for supporting me. And uh, you're all so nice. And if I can ever help any of you girls, you just let me know, OK? Awesome. Thank you so much, thank Andy. You, Andy. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a great thank night, you. everyone. Have a nice evening, Andy. Thank uh, you. Take care. Um, take care. Anyway, we do want to thank you from the Maggie Miggins group for coming on. Uh, just a little quick update on real estate. Um, it, everything you're reading about is true that you're seeing in, in our town. One of the towns we just wanted to kind of give you an idea about, which is where we're sitting at the moment, is something in Milburn and Short Hills. 
We have these for all the towns that we cover. So if there's a town that you'd like to know what's going on, we do this, uh, it's a micro on a weekly basis, what's happening in the market. Um, you could see something like, um, if you're looking to buy a house or sell your house, you're not sure where the pricing level is. If you look between a million and a million one out of the five homes that are available, four are sold. So there's really only 1.3 months worth of inventory. What that means to you is that the lower months of inventory, the higher price for a seller. So just so you're aware of that. Um, currently today in Short Hills, there's about 62 homes on the market, 63 homes, that's it. There's just not a lot of inventory, ladies and gentlemen. So that's just one of our uh, towns. And you can see things are selling on average days on market, 24, 32, 31. I mean, they're selling, and in fact, they're selling quicker than that. It's, Sometimes real estate brokers will wait to mark something as what we call as under contract. Um, but what you want to look at is the months of inventory on these sheets. And you can see anything below five months is really a seller's market. Uh, the only place you don't have a seller's market is between four and a half and $5 million, but there's nothing there anyway. But $5 million, five million plus, there's, a lot, there's five homes on the market. So just so you see, uh, 177 homes have closed in the last six months in town. So that's just one town. And then for Summit, just a different town, for those of you who live in Summit, we have the same sheet. Again, we do these every week. You could see if you have a house between a million six and a million six ninety nine, you'd be the only game in town because out of the five that are available, five of them are under contract. There is not one house to buy in Summit today between a million six and a million six ninety nine. Um, and so sometimes when you're looking at pricing as well, you want to think, well, well, should I, I mean, right now you could be pushing pricing because that's how hot these markets are, but in slower time markets, we use this as a gauge as well to decide whether we want to jump price up or jump price or put price down. Um, again, look at this in, in summit today, there's 33 homes on that's it. And the whole town of summit, there's only 33 homes that are available to purchase in the town. That, that's incredible. Historically, around this time in our, in our different towns that we cover, uh, we usually have about 150 homes on the market, anywhere between 120 to 160 in this spring market. There's just no inventory. <clears throat> Interest rates did just go down again. So if you're thinking about selling, I keep saying all my agents and all my clients, and I'm selling real estate 25 years, smart money selling, smart money selling right now today, because these numbers, we are better than we were in 2005 when I was at that market. And um, things don't stay up forever. So those are just two different towns. We have 15 that we cover. Please send us an email if you'd like to know what your town is selling for uh, and what the real estate market is doing in those. Um, as always, it's my pleasure to share any information we can with you. I hope you found this informative. Um, if there's, we'll send out a survey. We'd love to know what you like, what you didn't like, what you'd like to see the next time. Um, you know, if there's a topic that you'd like covered, it would be our pleasure to do it and find the best expert in that, uh, field and bring them to you. Thank you so much. Again, we're finishing two minutes early. It's 7:58. Um, thank you so much for your time. Happy Thursday night. Take care.